Okay kids, we're back and uh, today we're going to talk about something called resonance in air columns. Now this is very similar to when we showed you a video. It was a professor and his student and they had a spring and the professor started vibrating the spring and the student was holding it. It's, it's from a few days ago with this video. And then what we had was the setup of standing waves where you'd have an area of continual constructive interference, an antinode, big amplitudes, and an area of continual destructive interference, a node, very little zero amplitude. And that pattern was stationary, it didn't move. Actually, you folks answered some questions on this uh, in the assignment. So we're going to return to that topic right now, but instead of having one person at one end of a spring vibrating and another person at the other end of a spring just holding it, we're going to use a different type of wave and we're going to use a different material. We're not going to use a spring. What are we going to use? We're going to use the material known as air. And instead of a person vibrating it up and down, we're going to use a tuning fork. And there's two situations that can come about here. You can have a tube that's closed at one end. So what happens is here's a tuning fork. The tuning fork makes a wave and it's the original wave here in red. So the wave, the sound wave, compression, refraction, compression, refraction, makes its way down the tube and hits this closed end. And we talked about reflection already. We did questions in the last assignment about reflection. So when it hits the closed end, it's going to come back, go undergo closed or fixed end reflection, and a reflected wave makes its way back up the tube. So as long as this tuning fork is, has, is creating a sound, you're gonna get a continual production of original tuning fork wave going down and reflected wave going up. Well, lo and behold, kids, you've got a situation where there's two identical waves in the same material, in this case, the air, at the same time. So they're going to interfere with each other you're going to get an interference pattern here. The same thing, believe it or not, can happen is if you have a long tube that's not closed at one end, but open at one end or free at one end. You do the same thing. You get a tuning fork, and the tuning fork is going to create a sound wave. It's going to go down the tube, right? And at the open end or the free end, you'll actually get open or free end reflection, and the wave will come back this way and you'll have two waves in the same material at the same time and they're going to interfere with each other. Now just like standing waves in a spring that you did homework questions about and you did assignment questions about and we watched the video with that nice professor demonstrating it, if you have a frequency in the tuning fork or any source of sound wave that somehow matches the length of the tube, be it closed at one end or open at both ends, if you get a match of the frequency, you can get a standing wave produced in here. So this is what I wrote here, a match of the length of a tube to a frequency or a multiple of that frequency will produce a standing wave. And this would be a standing sound wave. Standing waves have big amplitudes. That's what we noticed when we were doing standing waves in the spring. So what happens is you get what we call air column resonance in there, and it sounds really loud all of a sudden. That's what happens. Now look, I'm gonna pause this video now, and you should pause it as well shortly, and I'm gonna get you to go to today's announcement and since I can't do the demonstrations for you, I've got two videos in today's announcement called Air Column Resonance Video 1, Air Column Resonance Video 2. There are some nice folks, physics teachers, physics professors on uh, YouTube that are going to do the physical demonstrations that we would have done in class. It's sad. I know we can't have physics fun together. Uh, but it's the best we can do now. So pause this video and let's go watch those videos on YouTube. The links are on today's announcement. Thank you.
Okay, so I hope you watched those videos, because if you didn't, it's going to make what I'm going to say kind of difficult to follow. So, let's say we've got a tube, like you saw in the video, that's open at one end, closed at the other end, and we have a tuning fork. And we want to match the length of this tube, known as the resonance length, RL1, okay, or simply L1 be the shortest length for resonance so it's a match between the frequency and this length not every frequency will match this length it doesn't work like that so in order for it to be the first resonance length we need to have an uh, node here very much destructive interference lot not a lot of air particle motion and an anti-node or loop here a lot of particle motion, constructive interference. This first resonance length, L1, occurs when this length, L1, matches a quarter of the wavelength of the wavelength produced by this frequency of the tuning fork. What we're going to show you now is a little computer simulation to help you visualize what that means. Now, I've put the link to this animation, and what it's showing you is what is happening to the air particles when we have a match of the frequency and the wavelength to the tuning fork to this length right here of the tube being a quarter of the wavelength. It's a quarter of the wavelength. And you can see that the particles here are definitely in destructive interference mode node there's a node here no particle motion at the other end we're in in constructive interference maximum amplitude maximum particle motion so this is what is actually happening to the air particles as they move uh, back and forth and we have resonance and this graph here shows displacement of the air particles the particles here they're hardly they are not moving and as you get further and further away from it, the particles move. And the red line is showing you the sweeping of this particle here. Look, as it's in the negative territory, starts to come back up, starts to come back up, is at the mouth zero, and then goes out. That is what is happening when you have first resonance. We're going to go back to my note now. All right, so now if we want to have the longer resonance length, the longer resonance length here, so we want to have length two, length two to match this frequency. We're, we're, we're sticking with the same tuning fork here to match this frequency. It has to be a length that produces a node here and still an anti-node here, but it's got to be longer than this one. So the only way we can have that pattern is if we put another anti-node in between. And then we have, excuse me, if we put another node in between and then we have the anti-node. All right. So to get to the next length, you've got to add another node. Well, adding another node mathematically means you increase this resonance length compared to the first one by adding half a wavelength. You're adding half a wavelength. Because if you take a look at it, here's the original pattern. There it is. Here's the original pattern here. But I want this tube to be longer, so I add this distance right here. We add a node to node distance. And we know from our previous work that a node to node distance in a standing wave is always half a wavelength. That's what we learned about. You did some homework questions about this. You did some assignment questions about this. So now we started at a length of a quarter wavelength. We add a half and we get the three quarter wavelengths. Let's see what that looks like in our simulation. 
So this is what it would look like in the simulation. We still have maximum displacement at the mouth. Here's the node that was introduced. Look how these particles are not moving. There's the node that was introduced. You're going to get maximum displacement here. All right, maximum displacement right there, and then another node. Now, the overall amplitude is smaller. Watch. See? Look at the size of that amplitude. Right? Amplitude is smaller, but it's still the maximum for this arrangement. Okay, we're going to go back to the note. Okay, so now we want to go to the next resonance length. So we still want an antinode here, and we still want a node here, but we want to go one longer. So the way we do that is we get a tube that allows another node to appear. See here we have one, two nodes. Over here we had one node. Now we're going to have one, two, three nodes. The way you do that is you add another node to node distance of half a wavelength. So to this three quarter lambda, we add another half a lambda. So we started with a quarter, we added a half to get to this one, and now we add another half to get to the next resonance length, which is five lambda over four. And what's really key here is every time you go from one resonance length, length to the next resonance length to the next resonance length, you always add half a wavelength. See, change in length is always half a wavelength. Always. So let's see what that looks like in the animation. So there we have it. Right here, here's the animation. Now one, two, three nodes. Now notice the amplitude is smaller. It is smaller, but we still have the standing wave pattern where you have destructive interference always happening at the same spots. The nodes and constructive interference always happening at the same spot. The anti-nodes are the loops. It's a standing wave. It's not moving. It's just a standing wave with air particles. So what we now have is an equation, yay, that will tell us what the resonance length is for any of the resonance lengths we want. For example, n can be 1. So you put a 1 in here, a 1 in here. So 2 times 1 is 2. Minus 1 is 1. 1 times a quarter is a quarter wavelength that works. How about the second resonance length? Second its resonance length, you'd put an n equal 2 in here. 2 times 2 is 4. Minus 1 is 3. Times land over 4 is 3 quarters. And it works all the way through to infinity. So this is the equation to find the resonance length for uh, a column of air closed at one end, open at the other, for any numbered resonance length you wish. Now, remember, if you didn't watch those YouTube videos, and this is going to be difficult to visualize because I would have done those demonstrations in class. If it's open at both ends, the first resonance length, resonance length one, or the shortest resonance length that will work for a particular tuning fork with its particular sound wave frequency and wavelength, it will occur, you'll get loud sounds, resonance, right, big amplitudes, if the first resonance length is lambda by 2. So this is different. The first resonance length is lambda by 2. Here it is. Antinode loop at both ends, node in the middle. Let's see what it looks like in the simulation. And there you have it. A okay, lot of particle motion at both open ends. That's why they're open ends. And right smack dab in the middle, you have particle, no particle motion for the air, a node destructive interference. That's what the first one looks like. So uh, let's say you have the same tuning fork, but you want to create this, the resonance length number two, or L2. You want a longer tube. So you still need anti-node loop at each end. You still need anti-node loop at each end. And now I have one node in the middle. Well, in order to get that to work, I add another node. So I add a node to node distance in the middle. And we know from our previous work that a node to node distance is always uh, lambda by two. 
So that's what we do here. So, so here's our lambda by two between here and here. Then here I got a quarter of a lambda. On the other end, I got a quarter of a lambda. See, quarter of a lambda here, quarter of a lambda there, quarter of a lambda here, quarter of a lambda there, and we added a lambda by two in the middle. So you add that add all up, and the next resonance length, the resonance length two is a full wavelength. So let's see what that looks like in the simulation. And there you have it. You can see the air particle motion with the sound waves coming from both ends there. Two nodes right there. And, you know, I'm putting the link to this on uh, today's announcement so you can play around with it, change different things, have some fun with it. That's one of the ways you learn, just playing around. Okay. So similarly, if we want to go to length three, I add another lambda by two length in here. So now I got my quarter wavelength at the beginning. I got my quarter wavelength at the end. But now I've got a lambda by two in the middle and another lambda by two but in the middle. So you add those all up and you get three lambda over two. Because you've got to have a antinode at each end. That's the way open at both ends works. So now here is my resonance length. But what's really interesting is to go from one resonance length to the next, it's the same as we did with closed at one end. You simply keep on adding half a wavelength to get you to the next resonance length. And here is an equation that will give you the resonance length when the tube is open at both ends for any resonance length. So for example, if you want to find the resonance length for the first one, right, you put a one end n one times lambda by two you did it lambda by two is the first length if you want to find the second resonance length right you put a two in here two over two is one you get a full lambda full lambda you want to find the third resonance length you put n is three in there so three lambda by two hey look you got the answer that's the way these work Let's see what it looks like in the simulation, this last one. And there you have it. One, two, three nodes in the tube. One node right here, another node right there, all with no particle motion, and another node right there. Okay, so very interesting there. Okay, so what we're going to do now is go over some of the sample problems uh, from the textbook. So here's sample problem one from this section. It says a vibrating tuning fork is held near the mouth of a column filled with water. The water level is lowered. The first sound, so when you see first sound, that means resonance length one is heard when the air column is nine centimeters long. Calculate the following. The wavelength of the sound from the tuning fork and the length of the air column for the second resonance length. So basically, you got resonance length one, you got your tuning fork, and when we get to this length of nine centimeters, all of a sudden it gets loud. That's what this means. And we want to find the wavelength for this shortest one, okay? The first sound wave loudness is heard at this length, okay? So this is the shortest one that will work. Now, you've got to remember that resonance length one is equal to quarter wavelength. And that's what they've done here. They're saying, look, that nine centimeters that you found is a quarter wavelength. You do some math and you get the wavelength is 36 centimeters. What is the second resonance length? Well, the second resonance length occurs at three quarters of the wavelength. That's where the second resonance length occurs, right? Second resonance length. It occurs at three quarters of a wavelength. So you just calculated what lambda is. So resonance length two is this three quarters of a wavelength, but we just calculated what wavelength was in the first one. It's 36 centimeters, right? and you can find what the resonance length 
was. It's 27 centimeters. So that's how you do that one. Okay, so here's the next sample problem. It says, the first resonance length, L1, of a closed air column. So the first resonance length, L1, closed air column. So it looks like this, closed at one end, open at the other, there'd be a tuning fork here. It occurs when we have 16 centimeters in here. So this length is 16 centimeters. And the thing we got to remember that is when it's closed at one end, that first resonance length always occurs at lambda by four. So that lambda by four is the 16 centimeters. So you say lambda by four is 16 centimeters. You do some math and you get 64 centimeters for the wavelength of the sound wave produced by this tuning fork. Now, they tell us that the tuning fork has this frequency and we wanna find the speed, V. Well, that's where you use the universal wave equation to find V. Speed of the wave is equal to the frequency wave times the wavelength. They told us the frequency of the wave. We calculated the uh, length, wavelength of the wave, but we got to use meters, right? You have to use meters. And we get a speed of 328 meters per second. So that's how you do that one. Okay, so here's sample problem three that we're going to work through together in here. It says an organ pipe, 3.6 meters long is open at both ends so it's oops I don't want to use uh, yellow let me use a different color here it's open at both ends all right there you have it open at both ends. produces a musical note at its fundamental frequency the simplest one resonance length one what is the wavelength of the note produced. So let's say you, you've got a tuning fork out here, it's making a sound wave, right? We wanna find the wavelength of this. Well, the thing you need to remember is that the first resonance length, when it's open at both ends, corresponds to lambda by two. So that's what they did for you in the textbook. Look, the first resonance length is lambda by two, that's your 3.6 meters. So you do some math and you get a wavelength of 7.2. Next, what is the frequency of the pipe if we know the speed of the sound? Well, that's where you would use the universal wave equation. We want to find frequency. We rearrange it, right? They tell us the speed. We just calculated the wavelength, so we know this. You do some fancy math, and there's your frequency. So that's how that works. So I've, I've kind of talked you through each of the example sample problems in the textbook in the hopes that that will help you with tonight's homework, all right? So the last part of today's lesson, lesson is just an application of all the things we've learned so far. So we've learned so many things. The human voice. Here's a, a picture from the textbook. All right, it's, it's very uh, interesting to look at. It involves air coming from the lungs, right? Air is going to come up from the lungs, right? More air. It's louder. So the more air you push through here, the louder it becomes. So we're talking about loudness here. We're talking about intensity. Remember we learned these words before? Loudness, intensity, sound intensity. That's all, how much air are you pushing through? Then the next really interesting thing is all about the vocal cords. They vibrate. So here is your vibrating object all of a sudden. This goes all the way back 
to when we started talking about waves. If you want to have a wave, you got to have something vibrating. It's your vocal cords. You can actually feel them vibrating as you sing or talk. If you just lightly touch the base of your throat, make a sound like, uh, and you can actually feel the vibration happening. So you can either try to have a very low frequency vibration, which would sound something like, uh, low frequency vibration, or you can try to have high frequency vibration uh, and everything in between. So this vibrating vocal cord is all about frequency. It's about pitch. Now the rest of it, the larynx here, the pharynx, which is the back of your mouth, your mouth itself, the lips, the tongue, the nasal cavity. Ever try talking by pinching your nose? I'm going to try to talk a little bit by pinching my nose. I'm not doing anything other than talking. All right. I'm not trying to make it sound different. I'm just pinching my nose. That's all about what we've just been talking about. The shape leads to the quality of the sound you're producing. It's all about what we've just been talking, resonance. All these things come together to make your unique voice. You can recognize someone from their voice. What are their, what, how are their vocal cords vibrating? What's the shape? You can, hey, do you have a cold? I, I know it's a change in your voice. Yeah, resonance, right? And that leads to us talking about the musical sound that can come from your human voice. Now, there's three characteristics to musical sound. Pitch, loudness, and quality. Now, pitch is very subjective. It's how you perceive the frequency to be. Loudness, very subjective. It's how you perceive the intensity to be. Quality is how you perceive it. So in red, we've got subjective things. They are uh, reliant upon some objective things. Pitch is reliant on something a computer could measure, frequency. Loudness is reliant on something a sensor could measure, intensity, watts per meter squared. Quality, you could map out on a computer uh, screen to take a look at the shape of the sound wave. But you might think its quality is good or bad. That's subjective. But the shape would never change. It could be pictured and measured. Now, the human voice, it slots into this. If you want to change your pitch, it's all about changing the vibration of your vocal cords. If you want to change the loudness, it's all about changing the amount of air that's being put, pushed in through your lungs. If you want to change the shape or quality, you can change the shape of your mouth, your nasal cavity, etc. So the human voice is definitely linked into this. So uh, long lesson today. I'm going to give you some homework to do on these questions. If you get stuck, please ask me. You can add a question to the discussion thread. I'd be more than happy to answer the question for you. All right. We're going to get through this. I'm confident in you guys. Ask me for help. Talk with your friends, and we'll get through it. Okay? Have a great day. Bye-bye.